Next up, we have a doctor of theology, author of numerous books, Dr. Paul Joseph. First of all, Paul Joseph is a humanitarian, I'm a businessman, and I'm a pioneer. Now, what does it have to do with Africa? Very interesting story. I'm going to break it down to you in terms of reality. Prior to 1985, I was up, an up-and-coming executive with the city of Houston. I was the airport manager, one of the airport managers at Hobby Airport. I helped to found and create, through Texas legislation, the Metropolitan Transit Authority. Prior to that, I was on the staff of Barbara Jordan. While at Hobby Airport, as an airport manager, I had an opportunity, a unique opportunity, to meet people, important people. As you probably know, the city of Houston owns the airports. And like Hobby, we have tenants, uh, Southwest Airlines, American Airlines, we have uh, many FBOs, which are, we call fixed-based operators. To make a long story short, many of you too young to know, but in the early 80s to mid-80s, there was a tr tremendous problem facing the people of Africa, particularly East Africa. There were some 26 countries in that region that were suffering tremendous drought and famine. Because of my position at Hobby and because of my faith and my willingness to venture from somewhere that was safe, I decided to call a group of people, my friends, two or three people at Hobby, and we elected to airlift food and medical supplies into East Africa, into Ethiopia and Sudan. Now, like Martin Luther King, to a lesser degree, I had a dream. So I wanted to share that dream with people at Hobby that I felt that trusted me and knew I was serious. So when I mentioned this dream to them, this desire to go 10,000 miles away from Houston to address the needs of Africans, they quickly said, yes, but how are we going to do it? By faith, I got a big company named uh, Rowan Drilling that had uh, 707 jet aircraft at Hobby. I asked them if they would fly me and my supplies into Africa. At first, they were skeptical. They didn't want to do it but faith prevailed. On January 3rd, 1985, I flew first trip to Africa. Didn't know anything about Africa. We flew into Khartoum, Sudan. And you're talking about a culture shock. You know, I'm from Fifth Ward, Texas. It's uh, a little higher than Third Ward, or lower, <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, the only thing I knew about Africa was that my mother threatened to send my brother, sister, and myself to Timbuktu if we didn't behave. Now, I didn't know Timbuktu was in Africa, but I knew it had to be a bad place. So here I am uh, in the desert on the border of Ethiopia and Sudan, and there's 150,000 starving men, women, and children. I was horrified. I had never seen anything like that in my life. To, to transverse the desert, at that time it was 120 degrees in the shade. And on the way to the mountain area on the border, 
I passed dried out carcasses of, of camels, goats, or whatever. And then to have the sounds of those wailing children, barefooted, with their mothers and fathers that had the look of hopelessness and helplessness in their eyes, and to smell the stench of death. And if you can imagine 150,000 people, as far as the eye could see, wandering in an area looking for food with no shelter. Many of them, if they were lucky, they had a pole, a stick, with plastic over it or cardboard. But I'll never ever forget those children, the eyes of those children, and those bare feet that had walked up to 500 miles to safety. When I came back to Hobby, by the way, this was before We Are the World and, and the Hands Around America and all that stuff. When I got back to uh, Hobby, I was so emotional and really disappointed that when I got there, what I had tried to do was not even a drop in a bucket. But I made a commitment that I would try to do more. So I took a leave of absence from my job as an airport manager. And um, Bishop Fiorenzo with the Catholic Diocese and Madeline Johnson and a lot of other folk helped me to raise additional supplies and money and tents to go back overseas. I ended up in West Africa. I found a wife. <laughs> I found a Senegalese wife. I have a lovely 19-year-old Senegalese daughter who speaks six fluent languages, including French. And uh, I have spent almost 30 years on the continent, 36 countries in Africa, trying to make a difference. You may, you, well, you don't know, but back in 1985, I was a pioneer. I started going into countries where I didn't understand the language. I didn't know the cultures. Africa has more than 2,000 languages. As of today, there are 1.1 billion people. It's diverse. We have a new country, a sovereign country in Africa. Uh, South Sudan is now uh, recognized by the United Nations and the world leaders. But Africa is very, very complex. But being from Fifth Ward, being from America, when I got to Africa, particularly in Senegal, I found that there was so much to do. So there then talks about the, the door of no return. <laughs> There's another door of no return at Goriada, which is a less than a 10 minute boat ride from downtown Dakar to the Isle of Gore, where there's another Portuguese fort, where millions and millions of Africans were drugged from the continent through that door of no return. Those who refused to go were murdered, either inside the fort, fort of holding cells, or as they went from the, the island uh, to the, uh, what do you call it, the dock to the ship where they were thrown into the sea or chose to drown. It's unbelievable. So with that, there was a unique sensitivity that Paul Joseph is only one person, and remember, only takes one person to make a difference. We had a long, I had a long talk with uh, Peter. You guys, you young people, are the future, not only of the United States, but of the world. Africa needs you. In 19, between 1985 and 1991, Moving around West Africa, I saw that they didn't have a decent telecommunication system. And even Senegal, as, as modern as it was, and Ivory Coast, if you wanted to make a phone call from Dakar to Gerbil, there was no line. Or when it rained, there was no line. So I had the idea to bring in cellular. I broke the first monopoly uh, prior to 1991, every African country had the monopoly on telephones. But through faith and hard work, I was able to get the first private cellular license granted in Ghana, 
Jerry Rollin, who was the president of God, God, I gave him the first cellular telephone. Anything is possible. A lot of low-hanging fruit. Africa is the last frontier. Diamonds, bauxite, titanium, people, but they need us to help to bridge the gap. Paul Joseph is a pioneer. My children, my family can no longer say they don't have a connection to Africa. I'm committed to Africa. There's a door open to return. Back in 1987, so you guys are too young maybe, but we're doing apartheid. You remember apartheid? The government was were killing innocent South African, indigenous black South Africans. I went there to see for myself. Those who old enough used to watch Nightline with Ted Koppel. Every night they were talking about South Africa, how blacks were slaughtered. Even blacks were slaughtering blacks, ANC. They were considered a terrorist group. They would kill one another. Give you an example. If I had a son that was between 12 and 19 years old, if the ANC came to my house and asked my son to join them, if he refused, one or two things would happen. They would beat him or kill him. A lot of violence, a lot of violence, but it gave me an opportunity to see for myself. I met with uh, Bota, President du Duclerc, I went all, I spent one month, the first trip, going all over South Africa to speak to the indigenous people, the Afrikaans, and members of parliament that consisted of Afrikaans and Indians. And I would ask the South African uh, Afrikaans, how can you claim, because I don't understand, how can you claim South Africa as your country? This is a black country. There are five million white South Africans and 40 million black South Africans. Yet, you have control over everything. 1987, 88, 1990, black South Africans had to have a passport to go from one area of town, not the country. Give you an idea. Go from, uh, from this university to the next community. If you didn't have a passport, you were subject to arrest, beaten, or disappearing. That didn't happen a long time ago. That's relatively recent. I would ask them, why do you claim South Africa? And he said something that was familiar to me. As a black American, when people would say who were racist, prejudiced, would say, why don't you people go back to where you came from? Well, I know I have African origins. Sharon, and I don't know where. How, how can I go back to a place I don't know anything about? Right. And guess what? The Africans told me. We don't know where we come from. We have been here hundreds of years. We know our roots are in Europe, but I can't tell you where in Europe. So what I'm trying to portray to you is that we are different, but we are, we are similar. When I travel all over Africa, I see people who look like me in Cap Verde Islands. When I go to Guinea-Bissau, when I go to Sierra Leone, Equatorial Guinea, when I go to, to, uh, to Liberia, I've even been several times to Timbuktu. How about that? You know. So, so Africa is a very diverse continent, the second largest continent in the world, with many opportunities but many challenges. I often meet with government officials, uh, businessmen, and I hear talk, and you've heard talk of a united Africa. You ever heard of that? United Africa, like United States? I've been there 30 years. Ain't gonna happen in my lifetime. Why? You have 2,000 plus diverse cultures and languages. And every country is different. 
I'm going to close because I can talk on and on. I have been through at least five coup d'etats. That means military takeovers. I've been in countries, G Gambia, Conakry, Sierra Leone, Liberia. No one would ever thought that a most developed modern country as Ivory Coast would fall to rebels and millions of people would be killed. We have to understand them as best we can, but we can't change them. We have to help them. We cannot force our culture and our ways on them. We have to bring them along in a civilized manner. Well, I'll leave it like that. I deviated, but I wanted to let you know that this is real. This is real. But Africa needs you.